Thanks, Fred. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to St. John's. Welcome to worship on this bright, although rather chilly morning. Uh, we had a lovely, messy church here yesterday, so thank you very much to all those helpers. We had a good number of families here. Uh, the Christmas fair is next Saturday. Uh, please come along, invite all your friends, your neighbours, your family, um, and if you can bake, if we've got any bakers amongst you, we would much appreciate cakes, please. Um, so if anybody can bake some cakes, that would be really good. So next Saturday, 11 o'clock, is the Christmas fair. Uh, and there's flyers and things, if you want to take some flyers to spread the news. Um, next Sunday afternoon, we will have our service in the morning as well, but next Sunday afternoon we have a special memorial service at four o'clock. If you've got the names of anybody that you want to be remembered and you haven't already spoken to Yvonne, give her a call and the names will be called out and remembered at the special service. That's next Sunday at four o'clock. Um, the churches together are doing uh, Christmas cards for prisoners. If you would like to write a card with just your name on it, if you've got a spare Christmas card and you would like to put your name on it and then perhaps get a couple of other people to write theirs on it as well, pop it in the envelope and then we'll have a box at church the next couple of weeks that we can gather Christmas cards that will be taken then to the prisoners just to let people know of that God loves them and that People are thinking about them. Um, the Christmas lunch uh, is on December the 5th, which is the church anniversary. If you haven't yet signed up, there is a list in the foyer for you to sign up to. And we welcome Keith to lead our worship this morning and we pause quietly as we get ready for our service. God, we ask your blessing for everyone gathered here today, for worship, for friendship, for support and for fellowship. We pray that all may gain what they need from this act of worship and carry your love with them when they leave today. Amen. Good morning, it is good to be with you. We gather together to worship the Lord. Oh come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hands. We sing the hymn number 57. Let all the world in every corner sing, my God and King. Number 57.
we join together in prayer. Let us pray. So we come, Lord, at this time and in this place to worship you with the whole of your creation. Loving God, we adore you, sovereign of all, we praise your holy name. Suffering Christ, we adore you. Saviour of all, we praise your holy name. Joyous Spirit, we adore you. Freedom of all, we praise your holy name. Shepherd God, our maker, redeemer and friend, we adore you, singing for joy in your presence, worshipping you with thanksgiving, humbling our pride with praise. For you are our strength, our protection and our hope, source of goodness and love, faith and healing. And with all the earth we call out to you in gladness. Before all the world we bless you as our King. We are the people of your pasture and the sheep of your hand. Eternal Father, whose Son, Jesus Christ, ascended to the throne of heaven, that he might rule over all things as Lord. Keep the Church in the unity of the Spirit and in the bond of peace, and bring the whole created order to worship at his feet, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. In years gone by, this Sunday, in the Church of England in particular, was known as Stir Up Sunday. From the opening words for the collect of the day in the Book of Common Prayer, which read, which are, Stir up, we beseech thee, O Lord, the wills of thy faithful people. For the ordinary people in the church pew, though, it was also a reminder that this was the time to make the Christmas pudding. Do any of you still make your own Christmas puddings? Oh, yeah, well done. So have you stirred them already? All done? Well done. When I was a child, I was used to go, enjoy going to help my grandmother make the Christmas puddings for various members of the family. I hope I was helping her. I'm not sure, you know, looking back. It was actually always on a Saturday that we did this and then went round again on the Sunday for the final stir before the picture was placed in the bowls. In the formal presentation of the lectionary, today is marked as Christ the King, or if you're being very formal about it, the Solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the Universe. It was instituted by Pope Pius XI in 1925. 
At that time, it was celebrated. <coughs> Excuse me. On the last Sunday, on the last Sunday in October, but in 1969, Pope Paul VI changed it to the last Sunday of the liturgical year, the Sunday before Advent. Pius wanted it to impact lay people. He said, The faithful, by meditating upon these truths, will gain much strength and courage enabling them to form their lives after the true Christian ideal. <clears throat> if to Christ our Lord is given all power in heaven and on earth, if all men purchased by his precious blood are by a new right subjected to his dominion, if this power embraces all men, it must be clear that not one of our faculties is exempt from his empire. He must reign in our hearts, sorry, in our minds. He must reign in our wills. He must reign in our hearts. He must reign in our bodies and in our members, which should serve as instruments for the interior sanctification of our souls or to use the words of the Apostle Paul, as instruments of justice unto God. So thinking of Christ the King, we sing the hymn number 319. Christ triumphant, ever reigning, Saviour, Master, King. Number 319.
It appears that the organ has uh, died on us, so we will uh, sit and read the last verse together. Oh, all right, oh, that's all right. Fred is moving over to the piano, so we'll uh, give him a moment. The wonders of modern technology. So now we ask our bless, a blessing on our junior church and all those who lead them that they may grow in their knowledge and love of you. Amen. And then we hear the Bible readings for today. The first Bible reading is from the book of Ephesians, reading verses 15 to 23. Thanksgiving and prayer. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. The sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes into his glory and all the angels are with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed with my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared you for your creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer the Lord. When did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you th something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick 
or in prison and go and visit you? The king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these humans and brothers and sisters, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Thanks be to God for his word. Uh, thanks to uh, Mavis and Diana for reading. Are we uh, back in business, Fred? I've got the thumbs up. <laughs> we therefore sing the hymn number 264. Make way, make way, for Christ the King in splendour arrives, number 264. The story is told that quite a number of years ago, an American soldier was sitting on a bus in Sweden, 
started talking to the man sitting next to him. The American, wanting to show what a wonderful country he lived in, said, America is the most democratic country in the world. Ordinary citizens may go to the White House to see the president and discuss things with him. And the man sitting next to him responded, that's nothing. In Sweden, the king and the people travel on the same bus. When the man got off the bus at the next stop, the American was told by other passengers that he had been sitting next to King Gustav Adolf VI. He was king of Sweden from 1950 to 1973, so I'm not sure if it's the same today. Somehow, though, I don't think that an ordinary person could just walk up to the doors of the White House and ask to see the president. Those of you who were here for the formal opening of the Revive Cafe a few weeks ago may recall that among our invited guests was our MP. He arrived without fuss and formality and wandered around chatting to people. If we'd been in South Riseleep, I'm not sure that it would have happened quite like that. We might have had a visit from our MP, but I'm sure there would have been all sorts of preliminary security precautions taken and possibly a considerable police presence. But to our parable. I'm sure that we've all heard the parable of the sheep and the goats many times. It's one that most of us are familiar with. It's one of the parables that underlies what modern theologians call the social gospel and was the basis of much of the work of ancient monastic orders and indeed some of the newer ones such as the Missionaries of Charity founded by Mother Teresa. It's possibly one of the most quoted parables, perhaps along with the parable of the prodigal son. All the nations are gathered together before the judge and they are separated, the right from the left, the sheep from the goats. And he judges them. And those on the right are saved, while those on the left are condemned. The judgment is made on the basis of the love, the compassion, or the lack of it, shown by those who are gathered before the throne. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. The Son of Man says to those on his right, whilst to those on his left he says exactly the opposite. I was naked and you didn't give me any clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. These are words of great clarity with a powerful message for those who will listen. But despite our knowledge of the story and its message, the message about the importance of our acts of sharing and caring, especially among those who are regarded as the least among us, the poor, the hungry, and the imprisoned. There are parts of the parable which it seems to me are sometimes glossed over. These, are, these points are the surprise expressed by the two groups when they hear the Son of Man say, I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me a drink, or I was naked and you did not clothe me, and I was in prison and you did not visit me. But why are they surprised? What is it that both the sheep and the goats seem to miss when they perform their good works, or when they fail to in this? Perhaps they are missing a, a sense of how the sacred meets with and is interwoven with the ordinary. Indeed, the sacred meets the less than ordinary in those places and those people that many might consider to be far from holy, far from being part of Christ, 
much less Christ embodied. Remember the words that Jesus uses. He doesn't talk about how blessed are we when we visit our friends who are sick, or how wonderful it is when we give good things to our family members and our fellow believers, or how nice it is when we clothe the folk who are just like us. Far from it, Jesus talks about the least among us, the least within this world, those whom conventional wisdom might even regard as accursed. People such as the poor of Calcutta, the thirsty in Sudan, the, Sudan, the sick in wards around the world reserved for those suffering from COVID or one of many other extremely infectious diseases that can be found. Jesus talks about those who are in prison, perhaps murderers, perhaps those who have only stolen so their family might eat. We don't know, but we do know that they are the least among us, people that some think don't count, people whose opinions many regard as unimportant or invalid possibly because of their age or gender as well. People whose cries might be ignored by many because of their race or economic position. And the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, claims to be among them and in them. And perhaps that is surprising to some. Perhaps some even consider it outrageous. There is no question raised in this parable of what creed either the sheep or the goats had believed or whether they had sworn allegiance to the Son of Man, the Good Shepherd. There is only the surprise that this exalted one, Christ Jesus, has been present in every, every person they had ever met and most particularly in the needy ones, the least important ones. And the surprise that judgment is based on whether or not we treat this king, this son of man, present in, in the least, whether we treat him well, or whether we ignore him in his suffering and want and need. It can be a bit disconcerting. It's easy to think that the important thing in religion is belief. And that if we believe in the right things, then we'll be saved. But that is not the message here. According to this parable, faith is more about awareness, about having our eyes open to the real world and responding compassionately to it. It doesn't matter whether or not we are aware that Christ is there. But the parable is calling us to see that Christ is there. To see the Son of Man in the crying child getting in our way. To hear God in the voice of the beggar sitting in the street appealing for money. The parable is reminding us of the importance of compassion and reminding us of the fact that the Son of Man is present in the needy of our world. We also need to remember that to encounter the least of the brothers and sisters of the Son of Man, we don't need to go to Calcutta or to the Sudan or to one of the overcrowded prisons of the land. There are many who are marginalized in this country. Many who are regarded as being of little significance in this, in this borough by many, by some. Many who are seen as not being equal 
to those close to us in the streets that we might be walking tomorrow. Remember the first and greatest commandment, that we are to love God with all our heart, soul, strength and mind. Or let us consider what John says in his first letter. In chapter 3 he writes, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? And in the next chapter, anyone who does not love his brother who he has seen cannot love God who is not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. The sheep, those on the right, have shown love for their brothers and sisters. And in doing so, they have shown love to God. And so they enter the kingdom prepared for them. Their faith is alive, even if they haven't fully grasped that fact. Even if they haven't recognized how the Son of Man is everywhere about them. One might say that the law has been written on their hearts and has guided their actions, if not always their thoughts and words. But think of it. If our eyes were open to the depth of the real world and not to the shallow world of conventional wisdom, then we would see God present in everyone and everything especially in the needy and the least important. And that would be even more transforming. Not only for the sheep, for those who are doing good, for those to whom they are showing, but, and for those to whom they are showing the compassion of God, but also for the goats, for those who might have the right doctrine but who may have judged the least among us as not being deserving of their love and care, as not being people in whom the Holy One dwells. What a priceless thing if the sheep are not surprised by the presence of the Son of Man in everyone and in joy remind those who may risk being judged as goats that all people are wonderfully made and all need to be treated as we would treat the Son of Man. It is somewhat provocative and gives rise to a number of questions. How far should we go in our caring? Who should we care for? And who, if any, should we not care for? How can we prioritize our caring so that the truly needy get what they need? While those who are just out to get everything, get all they can, do not. Or should we even worry about that? I can't answer that question. Any attempts any government make to try to provide a response to the challenge of that question, never get the approval of everyone. In recent weeks, the government announced changes to tax structures, which they say will benefit the poorest. But have they correctly assessed the situation? It's something that each of us needs to address on a case-by-case, -case, day by day basis. What we can say is that Christ is all around us. That Christ is in the least of us, in the single mothers, in the people with COVID or AIDS or any other extremely infectious disease, in the prisoners in jails, in the homeless on our streets. 
Think about this one last time. Think of it some 2,000 years ago when the Son of Man wandered as a poor preacher in a poor land with no home to call his own. Think of it when he was tried for blasphemy and flogged as a common criminal, then hung on a cross to die. Think about how the Son of Man came among us that first time, about the circumstances of his life and death. The prophet Isaiah, some 700 years before the, first, before the birth of Christ, puts it this way. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. He was despised and rejected by others. A man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Where is Christ to be found today? He is certainly here in this place, in us. But he is also here in ways that we do not so easily grasp. That we are less comfortable with. Thinking in these terms, we can perhaps understand the surprise of the sheep on the right of the Son of Man and the goats on the left. We can understand it because it was so easy to not see him in those who are reckoned to be the least among us. It is easy to have preconceived ideas about the people we meet and who they are or who they aren't. Remember the story I began with. The American soldier could not imagine that someone like a king would ride on a buzz. So he didn't expect to be talking to one. It's not difficult to imagine his surprise when he was told who he'd been talking to. In the same way, the two groups of people in the parable didn't expect to find the Son of Man in those who they had met in those they had responded to or had not responded to. Hence their surprise. But perhaps if we really think about it, we might also find it a little sad. This is not because doing good to the least among us has no effect when we're unaware. For clearly it does have an effect. It has an effect for those who receive our acts of kindness. And in reality, an effect for those who perform those acts. But seeing Christ in those around us can be so enriching, so helpful, as we walk the walk that he calls us to walk, if we allow it. Seeing the sacred in everything is so transforming for us and for our world if we allow it to be. Lord, when did we see you? When was it we saw you hungry or thirsty or naked or in prison and took care of you? And the king will answer them and will answer us. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these 
who are members of my family. You did it to me. Amen. We sing the hymn number 672, which is based on, our, on the parable. Where can we find you, Lord Jesus, our master? We want to serve you to answer your call. Number 672. So we come to our prayers of intercession. Before turning to prayer, I received an email from my chrono the other day advising that George Coney, who works on the fruit and veg stall in Blockswich Market, is seriously ill. And Mike asks that he be included in our prayers this morning. Our prayers are linked to our 
gospel reading and to the words, your kingdom come, I invite you to respond, your will be done. So let us join in prayer. Let us pray that we may serve Christ the King in meeting the needs of others. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When thirsty, you gave me drink. God with us, we pray for the hungry and thirsty of our world. For the victims of famine, drought, natural disaster, and the disruption of warfare. We pray for those forced to rely on the services of food banks. And we give thanks for those called to support and work in those facilities. Truly giving food to those who are hungry. So show us, Lord, what else we should do. Your kingdom come, your will be done. When I was a stranger, you took me into your home. When naked, you clothed me. God with us. We pray for those without homes or protection from the elements, for refugees, the destitute, those thrown out of home, those living on the street. Show us, Lord, what we should do. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. When I was ill, you came to my help. God with us. We pray for those who are ill, for those with chronic or life-threatening conditions, and those who are sick in mind or spirit. As we hear reports from various countries of increasing COVID-19 infections, we pray for all those affected by the disease for those they may have come into contact with. And we pray for all the scientists working to find new means of protection and new cures. We pray for George Coney at this time of serious illness. We pray for, in silence, for others known to us who suffer at this time, whether at home or in hospital. Lord, show us what we should do your kingdom come, your will be done. When I was in prison, you visited me. God with us, we pray for those who are imprisoned, for criminals, for prisoners of conscience, for those taken because they have expressed 
a view which is contrary to the dictates of their government. For those imprisoned by fear and guilt. Lord, show us what we should do. Your kingdom come, your will be done. In Jesus' name we love and serve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. O God of majesty, as you have raised your son Jesus Christ from the dead and exalted him as our saviour and judge, so give us life and call us to truth and compassion. O God of glory, as you have made your son Jesus Christ head over all things for the church, so increase that love which recreates us as his body. O God of mercy, as you have offered your Son, Jesus Christ, into the pain and hatred and grief of our world, so keep us faithful in suffering and wise in our witness. O God of renewal, as you have revealed your Son, Jesus Christ, in the person of our neighbour, so may we offer bread for his hunger, clothes for his nakedness, welcome for his loneliness, and grace in all the prisons of the soul. Amen. We sing the hymn number 398. There's a spirit in the air telling Christians everywhere, praise the love that Christ revealed, living, working in our world. Number 398.
please, please be seated. Now, Angela, as you have the microphone, would you like to uh, see what our young, your, our young people have been doing? It's good to see you all. <laughs> you can probably see what they've been busy making with Sandra, so I'll ask them to hold them up. And Success has volunteered to tell you what they've been doing. So I'm going to hold the microphone in front of him. We made some candles and we found some stars. He said we've made some candles and we've made some stars. They've actually hunted for the stars. Sandra sent them on a, a walk all around uh, Bill Topless Hall and they had to search for the stars just to remind them that it was the wise men who followed the star. So they've worked very, very hard this morning and hopefully next week they'll have something else to show us. Thank you very much, Angela, and thank you to the members of the Junior Church for all their hard work and their oh, very elaborate candles you've managed to get there. <laughs> well done. As the children of God, let us bear fruit in the lives of those around us. As the household of God, let us be salt in our communities. As the people of God, let us be light to the world, most appropriate, and let's join together in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>